Now, or, Justin, uh, Justin. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Some things you know just by being born. Some things you learn by watching. Some by reading. Some you learn by doing. And some things you learn simply by being. In a classroom with a professional teacher and doing all the required reading associated with the class. But none of us, not a single one of us, anywhere on the planet's surface today can learn everything about everything. So we pick and choose the thises and thatses of knowable things to learn about, so that the knowledgeable, knowable things we seek to know about are mostly made up of knowledge we wish our brains knew now. The following hour programming is dedicated to filling in brains on new knowledge they may not have known they didn't know, as well as increasing knowledge about new things the brain already knew it liked knowing about. And if you only knew as well as we do how much new knowing there is to do, you'd never miss a single episode of This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go. Kirsten and Blair. Good science to you too, Justin. Happy Thursday, everyone. Happy, happy science. Happy, happy, hip, hip, hooray, and toodly do. Toodly do. <laughs> toodly do. Welcome toodly to 1914 <laughs> science. Toodly do. <laughs> Lippity dee. <laughs> Lippity do now. That's right. We've been hearing all about. <laughs> 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 there are magical you particles and that. rocks that have fallen from the sky. We what, shall is this, use what is this two galaxy theory that you're you've been proposing? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everyone. This is this week in science, and we are here to talk about science news from the past week that we found that we think is interesting and that we think is going to be a great conversation, and that we hope that you'll enjoy as well. And we have a bunch of great stories on the docket for tonight. I have star stories about a viral collapse, virally collapsing. Uh, some Is it funny or is it too soon? I don't know when to tell a joke on Twitter. Um, huh. Maybe wh how men use anger strategically, supernovas, hey. antimatter, and so much more. Justin, what did you bring? I've got uh, I've got viruses. I've got uh, life on other in other other planets, perhaps. Maybe maybe not. <laughs> I have something for children should be afraid of, and. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, oh, and another virus story that's uh, a, a virus-free stem cell story. Ooh, that's exciting. Yeah, sweet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Blair? I have philandering chats. <laughs> I have uh, invertebrate sex. I have frogs, and I have the much-hated squirrels. The much squirrel. hated. I hey, like what? squirrels. I've never, awesome. What are you talking about? <laughs> hated squirrels. I've never been bitten by one or had to deal with one at the zoo, really. But I always find them yeah. quite cute. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I know. We we've heard your stories. <laughs> <laughs> the zookeeper's bane. The squirrel. If you're not sure, you're gonna have to listen back probably about a year ago. Mm -hmm. You were in Israel. Oh, you yeah. told us a story. Mm hmm. That's right. So let me tell you all a story. It has nothing to do with squirrels. Uh, but it does have to do with some, I don't know, I think it bites, personally, this story. Kind of bites. Um, there are some charter schools in Texas. This is, you know, 
leading, going for the news that we kind of follow regularly, Texas. It comes up when we're talking about education, science, that kind of but stuff. But never in the good way. Never in a good way. Really rarely in a good way, yeah. Um, Texas charter schools are uh, possibly flaunting the law and unconstitutionally uh, cr teaching creationism instead of uh... evolution properly in their in their programs. Yeah, there is a Salon article, Salon.com, that details uh, the these things from last fall. Um, but there, um, there's been a more detailed story that came through Slate. It's a follow-up. Um, science textbooks that are used in these charter schools uh, call Darwin's ideas dogma and sketchy. Uh, they never go to the point of telling lies, but they definitely um, teach with the intent of putting doubt into the student's mind. Um, related to the uh, geological transition of, uh, of fossils through the ages, the age of the Earth, Earth, and whether or not there are transi transitional fossils at all. And it's not, even, um, it's not even science where this is only happening. Yeah. It's also happening in the history textbooks that these charter schools are using. Um, and so the, the company is intertwined with an organization called Accelerated Christian e Education. Um, so and also it's a they use what's called a responsive ed curriculum. Um, anyway, teach, don't preach. Yeah. Anyway, this is what's happening. So if you're in Texas and your child's going to a charter school, maybe you want them to be getting this stuff, but maybe you should really take a look at what they're what they're learning if you haven't already. Um, other exciting news: antimatter in a beam. <laughs> A beam of anti-hydrogen particles was produced at CERN. This is very exciting because once we have a beam of anti-hydrogen particles that we can control, we can learn much more about antimatter because we really don't know that much about it. We do know um, that it uh, it is under the influence of magnetic fields the same way that matter is affected by magnetic fields. So uh, they are able to influence the atoms, which is how they were able to create the beam. Um, they're going to hopefully be able to uh, use spectroscopy and other techniques to be able to actually look at the anti-hydrogen, take advantage of their magnetic properties, and trap these hydrogen, anti-hydrogen particles and find out how they work, why they work. Um, additionally, being able to trap the particles in the way that they have been trapped and beamed, um, it will allow us, it's one step closer to controlling antimatter. And I mean, the big, it, we talk a lot about, I talk a lot about um, fusion, ignition fusion, but no, antimatter would be seriously a massive step forward for energy <laughs> if we could control antimatter enough. But it is also very dangerous, and there's the question of whether or not our governments would be interested in using it as a dastardly weapon of destruction. Or, or a, a, a totally benevolent, intelligently applied weapon of mass destruction. Because we can always, you know, there's always that route. There is That's always... worked out sometimes <laughs> in the past. Benign destructive weapon. We've yes. done pretty well, I think, with the destructive weapons that we've got. It just depends on whose government has it, I think. Yeah. If it's your government that has it, you're probably okay with it. Yeah. So, you know, to most people, this doesn't... this this result over at CERN doesn't really mean that much right now. You know, physicists are really the most excited about this result, but it could have some ramifications much further down the road. Um, finally, uh, colony collapse disorder in bees. Mm -hmm. It's a problem, yes? Yes. We do not like this. A bunch of bees dying off. Uh, we've had we've found a number of different potential causes, ranging from neonicotinoid pesticides to um, a fungus to uh, varroa mites. All sorts of things have lined up as to potential 
and possibly synergistic causes of the colony collapse disorder. Um, a new bit of research that has been published in the journal mBio has found the first ev evidence that a virus, it's an RNA virus from the tobacco uh, from the tobacco plant called the tobacco ring spot virus. Uh, research, uh, the study that they did showed that bees that were basically given amounts of this virus uh, ended up I think that's the study, or maybe I'm getting confused with a different study, but they did, they found that this particular uh, virus is definitely tied in with colony collapse disorder. The varroa mites are also um, part of this, the cycle of the virus in that they can hold the virus within their digestive cavity for a really long time and not digest them and then end up passing them to the bees. So the bees pick up the virus when they go to the flowers, uh, they bring it back to the hive, uh, and it's probably tied into pesticides, fungus, other things, and weakened immune systems making them more susceptible. But And, uh -huh. and one, th one thing to always keep in mind when we're discussing colony collapse is that the, the bees that we use, that we have, are, are, are hybrids and they're imported and they're not, they haven't evolved where they, they, are, they are living in the United States. They haven't evolved here, the bees that we are, we are using in this manner, that are, that are pollinating right. our plants. So mm -hmm. they, they have the robustness of a comparative, if you're comparing the robustness of a natural creature like a wolf, this would be the robustness of like a poodle, right? It's they're not they're not designed for this environment. They're not exposed to it throughout the the evolutionary path of getting here. So they have they're gonna have weaknesses to everything. Putting the insecticide thing on top of that, it's amazing we have any bees left. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One of the one of the other interesting things about this that um, that I just find interesting from the level, the scientific level, the viral level, is that this we're talking about a virus that has jumped hosts. It is jumping from plants, the tobacco host, to uh, insect insects. So we're jumping orders here. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, and so this does this does happen. There are many many insects that are vectors for plant viruses. I mean, they are so mm -hmm. intertwined with their reproductive cycles um, and and other aspects of their life history. It's not, you know, it's it's not too surprising that there that there are these viruses that do jump species. But um, it seems to be more so these RNA type viruses, according to what I read, that lead that tend to that, that can tend to jump between species. This doesn't mean that it's going to be honeybee to bird to people or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that, but it is just interesting that we have a virus jumping species and causing this amount of trouble. And and just to give us uh, some perspective here too, there I've got the this uh, virus uh, sort of virus study, I guess. It's a current issue of in Journal International Society for Micro. Uh, microbial ecology. Scientists from the University of Oldenburg and from the German Institute of Geosciences show that in deep, old, nutrient-poor marine sediments, so under undersea sediments, there are 225 times more viruses than there are microbes. And in, they're oh. saying that in, in such extreme habitats, viruses uh, make up the largest fraction of living biomass and take over the role as predator in the uh, in that that undersea ecosystem. That's interesting because that's I mean so often we talk about viruses and I still have not heard people really in the biology world say viruses are alive. Yeah. So that's an interesting interesting statement for them to make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, but with the decreasing nutrient levels, the ratio between virus and cells shifts towards the viruses. Uh, for several years, it's been known that the biomass of all micro microbes within the seafloor equals that of all life in the oceans above, which then pretty much, I mean, it's the, the microbes living beneath the seafloor are most of the biomass of the planet. It's ridiculous to try to mm -hmm. picture that, but there it is. It goes, you know, they go down 
hundreds and hundreds of feet. They they fill a, a larger area uh, of the planet really than we do because of that. Uh, in the extreme environments, these viruses take over the role of predatory organisms. They control size and composition of the microbial community. The surprisingly high number of viruses can be explained by the fact that the small but active microbial community permanently produces new viruses that remain in the sediment for longer uh, because the few m microbes produce fewer enzymes that can destroy the viruses. So they live longer, they're getting produced there, and they're not getting destroyed. Uh, Quote, previous... unquote, live longer. Right, of course, right. right, right. Um, We're still going to put that <laughs> disclaimer, 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 live longer. Yeah, so the reason it's the not thing. life, right, is because it can't survive without other life forms. Right. It's a parasite, so, but not. it's not quite a parasite. Right. Yeah. So here's, the qu here's, here's where, where this question will be defined. It, I don't think it will be defined on Earth. I think if we discover a virus on Mars, we will declare we have discovered life on Mars. Mm. You know, I don't think you can find a virus and go, eh, it's just a virus, there's no life there. I think then we go, ooh. But the definition of that is that if you find a virus, that means there must be something alive for the virus to live off of. Assume, uh, we, we may assume that. You might assume Unless, yeah. That it would have to. It would have to, uh, because of the lack of atmosphere, there would be deterioration of the viral DNA or RNA over time. So even though the virus could probably exist in the environment or underground in the dirt for a long time, I mean we know that there are. Or in the ice. Or in the ice, yeah. There's uh, there's definitely the possibility of these things being stuck in stasis because they don't have anything to live off of, mm -hmm. um, and we could find that. But the probability of them being not mutated in some way, damaged in some way from uh, solar radiation, environmental uh, deterioration, I think that would be unlikely. Well, we, we, we did but, discover uh, there was the LSU study a while back that showed that uh, DNA repair, now this is, this is in microbes, of course, DNA repair continued even though for all uh, other essential functions of microbial cell, this microbe was shut down, completely shut down and frozen. Uh, and, and yet there was no DNA degradation because the DNA repair systems continued to function. They were looking at microbes that had been tra uh, trapped for hundreds of thousands of years in ice. Right. So, so that gives us hope for being able to... That's, it should give us a good clue of where we should be looking for signs of existence of life. We gotta check the ice. We gotta do ice. Look in the samples. ice. Look maybe you'll find a virus, but I don't know. You'll probably find a probably microbe. Probably not a virus. You actually may be more fun. likely to find a microbe. I don't know that the uh, virus yeah. can can maintain has a DNA yeah. repair system go functioning like a like a microbe, although yeah. they no, do have a history of living lasting. Longer. <laughs> they don't have all the fixy up stuff. That's why they use the cellular the cellular reproductive uh, machinery, because they don't have to carry it all around. They don't have that, all that trouble. Yeah. Um, Justin, did you have another stem cell story, though? There is a stem. Uh, well, there's another. Virus not, I mean, not story stem. I mean, virus and stem cell, or no virus and stem yes, cell. Yes, this is uh, John Hopkins uh, Medicine. It's lab-grown, virus-free stem cells repair retinal tissue in mice. Investigators, John Hopkins report they have developed human-induced pluripotent stem cells capable of repairing damaged retinal vascular tissue in mice. The stem cells, derived from a human umbilical cord, the cord blood, and coaxed into an embryonic-like state, were grown without the uh, use of viruses, which can... Uh, viruses, when they're used, they can... It's, it makes it easier to produce these stem cells, I suppose, but... They mutate genes and can, initiate, uh, can create cancers, uh, according to the scientists. Their safer method of growing the cells has drawn increased support among scientists, they say, and paves the way for a stem cell bank of cord blood-derived uh, human or induced pl uh, pluripotent stem cells to advance regenerative medicine. So this has been nice. one, of the, one of the issues is we've been working with a lot of these uh, stem cells uh, through with mice and everything, but they there's 
viruses through it that are connected to it and being used to help do this. So then the question is, how could you ever use the stem cells that you produce from this if they're riddled with viruses, right? So um, here we go. We, they've they've found a way to do without viruses. Yay! Yeah, sounds awesome. That's awesome. If you just tuned in, this is this week in science. We're here every Thursday night, sometime after 8 p.m. Pacific time. And right now, it's time for. She loves my creature, cry that song. Buy a pet, fill a pet, no pet at all. Wanna hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. All right, so let's jump right off with some invertebrate action right now. Flies with brothers make gentler lovers. Yeah. Wait, what? Yes. <laughs> Flies living with their brothers cause less harm to themselves and females during courting than those living with unrelated flies from Oxford University. So are these like Drosophila or are these like yeah. house flies or Drosophila? These are Drosophila. Okay. And they had three or three different situations where they had virgin male flies, three virgin male flies and with a single virgin female. And they had them in three different ways. AAA, where they were all brothers. AAB, where there were two brothers and one unrelated male. And ABC, with three unrelated males. They found was that flies in the AAA group, so all brothers, were typically more relaxed in their attitude toward mating and spent less time harassing the females than males in the other groups. This approach worked against them in the AAB groups because the B fly had as many offspring with the females as both of the A's put together. So the unrelated fly competed more and was more kind of on top of pursuing the female constantly rather than the two brothers. So the brothers have very little reason to harm each other or compete in general because they have almost the exact same genetic success if their brother wins out than if they win out. Their DNA still make it. Um, so what they found also was that whereas the males kind of thought it would be to their advantage to not compete if they were roomed with their brothers to compete for this female, the female's fecundity often dropped. Fecundity is reproductive success in females, right? So it often um, dropped when they were brothers as well. And they were trying to figure out what that was. There wasn't a lot of physical harm on the outside of the female, but what they thought might be happening is that they were competing less obviously and they were monopolizing her time less. Um, but by monopolizing her time, she can't get food, she can't rest, and so that's why her fecundity drops. So she, she's like constantly fighting off advances. I just can't sleep. I can't rest. There's all these guys constantly bothering me. So it's interesting because it's kind phone. of a... It's something that they're trying to do to have a genetic advantage, but it's actually causing a disadvantage in other ways. So it's interesting. I guess that the advantage of not fighting with your brother won out over the advantage of not pestering the female. Hmm. Right. Evolutionarily, so even I, though your genetics might benefit from your brother getting there just as much as you did, it's that outweigh or that is outweighed by the success you get despite bothering the female. <laughs> yeah, when there's competition. What I've always wondered is how the, um, you know, when you have a brother, when you have a sibling, there's this idea in, um, you know, of this family relatedness that is throughout animal behavior. And I just always wonder, how does an animal know that they don't need to fight with their brother because it's going to be okay, their genes are, half their genes are going to get through anyway? 
You know, what? Mm-hmm. why isn't there more like Cain and Abel kind of stuff going on? It's because genetically your body's telling you not to fight with somebody who has your genes because it would benefit you as well as them to leave them alone. Yeah. <laughs> because if your brother or your sister is successful in terms of propagating offspring, if they're successful, you're successful by default. Yeah. So you don't want to fight with them. Um, I just wonder if there, you know, I haven't ever seen a study, but I wonder if there's like a mechanism to reduce testosterone or other, um, or cortisol or other things that might make you more aggressive when you're around a sibling versus a stranger. I would guess it's hormone and pheromone related. That would yeah. be my guess. Is that mm-hmm. just like with the classic study where you can smell women find men more attractive, their smell more attractive if they're less genetically mm-hmm. related, there's probably a similar kind of calming sensation from smelling a relative. I would assume. Yeah. yeah. Kind of calm yourself down. Don't fight with this person. They carry your DNA just like you do. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's interesting. There's there's obviously there's benefit to not fighting with your brother. Then there's an additional benefit to fighting for the female that actually outweighs it. So, like that's the really telling part of this study is that the AAB group, despite having two males fighting for this female that were related, their success combined was not as much as the third that was fighting the entire time and trying to monopolize the females time. Hmm. So the females hmm. kind of got the, the the short end of the stick on this one <laughs> because it obviously is beneficial to bother her more and compete. It's beneficial to bother the girl. <laughs> yeah, so it's flies with brothers are more gentle, but it's actually beneficial to not be gentle. So yeah. that's kind of. And then I want to talk about chats. Like, chats. like our web chat so that people who yeah. are watching the show they can join our web chat if they wanted to. If Yellow. you're watching at twist.org slash live there's our web chat. Slash live yeah. Or webchat.freenode.net Right, but that's Hashtag not what you're twist. talking. That's not what you're talking about. No, I'm talking about <laughs> yellow-breasted chats. Ah, I love them. Oh, yeah, yeah. this sounds interesting. They are a, a diurnal bird, aka non-nocturnal, found um, in, in the University of Illinois. They were studying these guys, so they're found obviously in Illinois, and they were studying birds' movements. So what they did is they fit these birds. Uh, 32 birds were captured in mist nets, their age and sex were logged, and then they were fitted with a lightweight backpack radio transmitter that emits a signal that is picked up by four towers, each with six antennas. It sent information in um, every three minutes, yielding approximately 12,000 data points per bird, and they located nests every two to three days until eggs hatched or the nest was eaten. (laughs) And They were checking out to see if it was kind of, if the the data collecting equipment was um, calibrated correctly. So they were just checking the data points in the middle of the night because these birds are diurnal birds. They'd expect to see the exact same data point over and over every three minutes all night. So they were just checking it for calibration. And they found something really weird. They found, so the females are supposed to get up at night in their nest and roll the eggs so that the membrane won't stick to the eggs uh, internally. And this is just a tiny bit of movement, but they expected the birds just to kind of move it, go back to sleep, move it, go back to sleep. And all of a sudden they saw something that couldn't have been right. (laughs) The bird is on the nest for an hour or two, and then all of a sudden they're moving all over the place. Were these signals getting confused? Were they bouncing around? What's happening? These birds, their vision isn't bet any better than ours. So there's no way that they're foraging in the middle of the night. They eat insects. There's no way they're foraging. Why are they going out when they have eggs to take care of? The females on top of this, they were only moving during their fertile period. So... 
Hmm. It turns out. I can. I, oh, are they? Go ahead. Are they? Are they? Are they visiting other nests? Are they? Are they doing it? They're philandering. <laughs> yes. They're philandering. philandering. But they're also going. This is my favorite part. To a chat nightclub. Quote unquote. <laughs> what? Yes. A so gathering me, spot. Yeah. So. Uh, they found that these females were only going out during their fertile period. And they do it kind of to sneak away from the male that would also be taking care of those those uh, eggs. So they're trying to sneakily get some on the side. <laughs> uh, but they're also, they're doing it at night so the male won't see them leaving. That's specifically what they think. It's so that they can do it stealthily. The females can get their extramarital affairs going without the male knowing because males are, are of this species are less likely to care for eggs if they've seen the female being unfaithful, which makes that sense. That makes you sense. Don't, you don't mm -hmm. want to take care of someone else's genes. You want to take care of your own genes. Um, but so what they found specifically was that they might actually have specific areas where all of the males and females looking to score, I guess you could say, go. So there's a known location for copulating. Wow. That's pretty sexy for a bird. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, and it takes it away from the wow. nest. It's like, mm -hmm. don't, don't dirty the nest. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you don't want to go into another party. Party. partner because if if the if your partner's being extramarital or extra, I don't know what the word would be. Extramarital? Not extramarital, but if they're if they're being unfaithful to their they nest call, mate, they call them EPCs, extra right. pair copulations. Extra pair copulations. Thank you. Yes. So if that's what they're doing, they don't want to be seen either. So the nightclub is the perfect place for them to meet up. <laughs> But, so but these now, cats, they uh, figured it out. Yeah. So the but there's got to be there's males there too. <laughs> and mm -hmm. Just I'm sort of picturing like showing up at the spot. Oh hey honey, how you doing? Well okay yeah, so yeah, I was going out for worms. You too? Yeah, I don't know what's what's going on here <laughs> at this party here. It's a I was trying, I was looking for something else, but uh oh man. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So the. The the females are not the only uh, the only the only birds doing it either because if you think about it the the if the females are trying to go off and have um, EPCs they have to find a male to do that and it's not it, they're not for, they're it's pretty much fifty fifty the population male and female so it's not that it's there's all these males waiting around that don't have females the males are sneaking off as well and these males Just are trying to get other male. males <laughs> the males are trying apartment. to get other males to take care of their genes for them right so that's part of it is if you can find a way to sneakily inseminate a female and get her to lay your eggs and have another chump take care of them that is ideal as well yeah the birds sneaky effers Smart. <laughs> and that, that term I just used, it's a term that is used within science by the, bi the biologists who study these birds. Sneaky efforts. As opposed to birds who engage in EPCs, which is a much right. longer phrase. Yes, sneaky efforts. <laughs> well, sneaky you know, efforts. even in fish, there's this, the sneaker males, exactly. which are basically the same thing. So there's all yeah. sorts of fun words. Oh, the swinging nightlife of the yellow-breasted chat. Mm -hmm. That was exciting. That was so Night exciting. club, chat nightclubs. <laughs> Should we go to the break? Is it time? Yeah, definitely. All right, everybody, stay tuned. We'll be back with more after this. Don't go away.
All right, everyone. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 150,000 titles in their library these days. Good gracious, that's a lot of books, and so many of them are science. You can get sciencey goodness from Audible, and all you have to do is sign up for their service right now and go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist. That's T-W-I-S. Uh, go there, sign up for their service. You get one free audiobook download just for signing up, and we get a little kickback too. So you're doing good, getting something, and then Audible gets you as a client if you really like their service, which you probably would if you like to listen to books and hear people tell you things as opposed to other ways. But anyway, audiblepodcast.com slash twist right now. The other place to go is twist.org because we have merchandise that you might enjoy. Head on over there and you can get some of our swag. We have a link on our website that goes directly to our Zazzle store. That's right, we have a store front in Zazzle, Zazzle land that has hats, t-shirts, etc. Good, good stuff. Go to twist.org, click on the Zazzle store link in the main, main menu bar and start buying right now. And additionally, Twist is supported by listeners like you. Your donations pay for our hosting, bandwidth, contractors that we like to hire, fun things that we try to do for the show. We really appreciate any amount that you are able to give. $2, $10, $100. You make this show possible. We currently accept donations in a couple of ways. First, we have PayPal donation buttons on each show page on our website, twist.org. Or second, we have started a Patreon account at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. It's kind of like a Kickstarter for media producers where you can get stuff in return for your donation. And it's a per episode donation. So if you donate $2 every time we publish an episode of Twist, um, at the end of the month, when we've published four or so episodes, you will be charged $8 for the month if that's what you decide to donate. Whatever your preference is, go to the website and listen to the most recent episode that we have produced. This one will be done pretty soon. Comment on the show and make a donation. If you can't afford a donation, we can always use your help to get more people listening to and watching Twist. Use your social networks for science! That's right. You can help us. Tell people to tune in to Twist. We thank you for your support. We really could not do this without you. Shows the way to go. No conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. Put on a pair of goggles and go look at for the things I couldn't. And we are back with more This Week in Science. And I wanted to quickly do a uh, answer a QA question from our uh, Google On Air Hangout. Paul Harden uh, asked if we were aware of any researchers systematically stressing bees out to try and evolve more resilient strains that still make honey. That was when we were talking about the colony collapse disorder at the in the first part of the show and I personally am not aware of that kind of research but I do believe that's how we ended up with Africanized honeybees because the African bees Although aggressive, produced a lot of honey and they thought they could mellow them out with regular honeybees and then that didn't work so well. Instead, we have swarms of bees that actually look to attack people. Yeah, well, I don't think they look to attack people. They, they do. I mean, they, they, well, they, you, can, you can, I'm not trying to anthropomorphize the bees there, except that they do have a pattern of pursuit and continual stinging that isn't in existence in the regular American honeybee. I mean, you might get stung by a bee, but you won't have a swarm 
chasing you as you run down the street. <laughs> seeking yes. shelter in places. They're just highly protectively aggressive. They're extremely aggressive. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. They want to hurt you. Yes. Yeah. So I, anyway, I wanted to answer that question because I saw it in the Q and A list. Thanks for asking a question. If you have topical questions related to what we're talking about, and you're watching on Google Plus, go ahead and ask a question. And if we see it, we'll try and answer them. All right, Justin, do you have any stories to tell? Okay. Uh, there's a this one. Study finds 66 children are daily being treated in emergency. Uh, emergency rooms for shopping cart related injuries. What? So I'm How glad many? That the, uh, 66 children. And I'm glad that this study identified them so that perhaps they will uh, stay away from sharp shopping carts. Because if they haven't learned by now, those kids probably aren't. At, and how do they are they around shopping carts every day? I also wonder. Oh, wait, no, th it's not the same 66 children. Hang on. Uh, so, <laughs> right. <laughs> this, this, I'm sorry. This is, this is 66 a day nationwide uh, right. are being, yes. are That's being a treated lot. in emergency rooms. Yeah, so in, in fact, the, it's, what's interesting is they're finding that the numbers have been going up. So uh, it's, it's that 66 a day... Uh, let's see here. Is this uh, an estimated 530,000 ch injured children were documented during the study period, which was a two-decade study, averaging more than 25,000 children a year, which equals about 66 children a day, or one child every 22 minutes. That's wow. Being treated in an emergency room for a shopping cart-related shopping cart-related injury. Most commonly injured body region is the head. That's seventy-eight percent, and it, probably it, people not strapping their kids into the shopping carts. The kids crawling out of the shopping carts and cracking their heads on the floor. Correct, which is a pretty serious, severe injury. Yeah. For, you know that for and it's it's usually these children tend to be, uh, you know, under under like six months of age. You know, so they they tend to be very very or sorry zero to I'm sorry most. The increase in the injuries was mostly between children zero to four years of age, uh, but a lot of them are are of the younger, younger, younger category. They can squirm around in those seats. Yeah. Parents are looking one direction, trying to pick the right cereal, trying to read which thing has you know the right kind of sugar in it or not sugar in it or whatever, and then boom. So they they had some suggestions here on how they could do this. Of course, one is education. You can't get into a shopping cart that doesn't have disclaimers and warnings. Danger, danger! Don't let your children be anywhere near this shopping cart. <laughs> Unless I do think when I was little, when they were, I was little, there were little click seat belts on They're the cart there. basket. They're I haven't seen there. any in a long time. Really. Interesting. Yeah. Um, oh, they still have those click seat belts yeah. on the shopping yeah. cart. I use looking. them every time I go to the store and have my son. Either, either I've been to a, a large retailer recently that has the very plasticky carts, and mm -hmm. I do not remember seeing any sort of buckle. But if you're not looking for them, you're not necessarily going to be. You may, yeah, you may be missing it. I, I, they're everywhere out there. Spotlight. My, however, yeah. I never, I actually, I've actually always kind of broken the rules of the shopping. I put like, but safely, I think. Um, although that's only because I think. Because there, there's some of these accidents, because here was I was going to describe a lot, like with a very young child, I'll take the car seat and put it in the basket. Right? What could be safer? They're strapped into the car seat and they're in this cage as we travel around. But some of the accidents, some of the accidents are the result of, the shopping carts tipping over. Tipping over. Some of the accidents that are sending kids to the emergency room have to do with either running into or being run over by a shopping <laughs> cart. Right? Either the parent or another shopper coming around a corner, smacking into them real solid. Um, and, you know, my kids, uh, my older kids hang on the sides of the shopping cart and then we use it like a skateboard and we zoom down the aisles. I, I put a foot up and then I'm kicking off and we're just flying down. So I, I'm, I'm very guilty of having broken every shopping cart safety rule <laughs> in, in existence. 
Uh, one of the interesting things, though, that they suggest is a redesign of the shopping cart. One of the ways they could do this is put where the children sit lower to the ground, which would do two things. Hmm. If the kid does fall out, they've got less far to fall, and it also lowers the center of gravity of the shopping cart, so less likely to have some sort of tip-over scenario, which I'm still That's trying to picture. I can't... I mean, unless, I guess, maybe out you're leaving the supermarket you and decide you're going to go, gonna go over the a curb. curb or something. Yeah. Like, it's, it's not really easy to get those things... Tipped they over have the ones that shopping. that they look like a car in the front, yes, like a yes, Playmobil those are car, awesome. and then there's the cart in the back. Those are pretty cool. Those are really cool, except the yeah. car ones. The car ones make the shopping cart longer, yeah, less wieldy, and you're and and one of the other ways that you're liable to cause your child to need an emergency room is sort of by clipping, uh, sort of like the keep your hands and feet within the ride at all times mm -hmm. kind of thing, um, which is harder to monitor when they're down and in front of you uh, and sort of out of sight and the cart's further so it's a little less wieldy. So there's lots of lots of danger in the supermarket. So uh, I guess this is my question. Is this an increase? Is this a rising trend? Or yes. Yes. By That's how much? The, over the last two decades it has increased. Yes. So uh, let's see. do you oh, really think ahead. it's more dangerous or do you think parents are paying less attention? Um, I think... Think you know it's a great question. I know I know, sh you know aisles seem to have gotten wider, so you would think that would reduce the number of injuries. But the number of people on the planet has increased, so maybe well I would also and say, cell phone use has increased. Yeah, that's what oh, I was going to say. Wow. There never used to be cell phones. Then there were cell phones that little flippy deals that were just to talk on, and now they have these screens. Wow. So you're look you're not looking at your kid anymore. And if you're looking at your grocery list that's on your phone and you're trying to text somebody and you're doing, yeah, less attention on the task at hand necessarily. So, so listen to this statistic then, and I wonder if they're connected then. Wow. So from, uh, okay, the annual rate of concussions increased significantly during the study period by, guess a percentage. Guess a big percentage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, what is happening in the grocery store percentage? Guess. Uh, 10%. 10% would be, wow, that's an increase. That's But that's just an increase. Give me give me the wow. 200. Exactly. Nailed it. Exactly 200%. <laughs> Doubling. Exactly 200%. Okay. Number of these injuries um, in 1990, 3,483. The number reported in 2011... Was actually even high, twelve thousand three hundred thirty-three. That sounds like even more than two. Sounds like a three hundred percent increase. Yeah, that sounds even bigger. Just crazy. But that, but the concussions went up two hundred percent. But the number of injuries in general looks mm. like they went up uh, threefold, almost, um, gearing towards four. Just wild. Be careful, people. Yeah, watch your kids. So many distracted shopping cart drivers. Right? Children. And a concussion in a you know a young it, child is a seriously scary thing. Yeah, I think the advice that we can give is try to be present in the store. Try not to rush too much, even though you might be in a hurry. There's you. There are the people around you, and always take that into account. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they need maybe they need to redesign it so that also so that you can take a car seat and click it in or something or they come equipped because maybe maybe it's just the even that little lappy belt thing isn't good enough I don't know that seems like a, a incredible incredible thing bad parents bad parents oh. <laughs> <laughs> well Dave Friedel in the chat room is saying that it's more of a dad's versus mom's thing. Competition. And oh, so it's like so it's Eric like, Driscoll. It's like, Eric in marriage, Driscoll in the Q and A is suggesting. Dishes, <laughs> yeah. when, in a marriage, new marriage, you're, you're asked to wash the dishes. You take the best, most prized piece of china that you received from the from the wedding, and you break it. The uh, and then and the next time you're asked to do the dishes, you do it again, so that you're no longer asked to do so, dishes. This is maybe men trying to get out of having to do the shopping. I you never have to go to the grocery sense. store again. You'll never. never. 
Never take our child there again. Okay. Eric right. Driscoll suggested that dishes. possessed shopping carts might be the explanation. Maybe mm -hmm. not. Maybe not possessed shopping carts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Andreas Andrade says parents paying less attention also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Attention, people. Attention. Get it together. Maybe yeah. it's also connected to the rise of the big box stores. Maybe these maybe these injuries are taking place in the in those in giant shopping carts in giant giant big box stores. Yeah. Uh, so when is a joke about a tragedy funny, and when is it too soon? Ooh, it depends oh. on how bad it was. <laughs> Did you have an answer, Justin? Well. It's I like it can be that funny one. right away, but you might not want to share it right away. Yeah. <laughs> you might not want to share the joke. It might still be funny. You might have like three friends you can tell the joke to who will get that you don't mean it in the bad way, but that it is funny that you put it together, like just as a joke. But yeah, maybe never. I think it depends on how, how big the death or injury count was, and it depends on how close your audience was to the tragedy. That's what it's I think. There, these are probably all things that are involved. Um, a new study <laughs> from a group, um, Peter McGraw and colleagues, looked at um, Hurricane Sandy in 2012, and they plot the way that jokes, as they were tweeted, mm. uh, were rated as offensive uh, or were funny before the, the hurricane struck. Offensive, offensive and unfunny as disaster struck, and then funny as the horror faded, and then unfunny again. And so mm -hmm. it, it turns out that um, the funniness of jokes declines from 36 days after the tragedy. And um, they, uh, they had a group of 1,000 people that they looked at, um, and beginning the day before, they had 10 different time periods, beginning the day before landfall and then in ensuing days and weeks, and uh, people's responses fell into two distinct time frames. Uh, over the course of the week during the hurricane, funniness of tweets peaked prior to the arrival and then diminished when reality became apparent, and then the second time frame was two weeks to 99 days after the hurricane struck, and the tweets got funnier and funnier gradually, and peak funniness is 36 days after <laughs> hurricane tragedy. So, the, so basically, it also says our, our human empathy is about a one month window. About a one month window. <laughs> yeah. we, How long are you going to remember again. it? Then we don't care anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I just I think it's interesting that people are starting to look at because there's always you know some people will make comments and there's the oh too soon ah yeah. uh, you know you're like ah uh, is that okay to joke about and it is really a an interesting social question of when is it okay to make light of something that was terrible is it ever okay for some uh, for some things to be joked about at all I mean humor is something that lightens a mood can get people to get through difficult situations um, to be able to think about them more healthily and it's a, it's actually a, an okay psychological reaction humor is humor's great gets people through a lot of stuff so it's just interesting to see how the social aspects of it play out um, so is it is it then but it also only has a certain window and then you get far enough away and people are just disinterested in it so Yes. I guess yeah. I guess and then it goes I, away. I guess I held on to that stand up routine of nine eleven jokes a little too long. <laughs> like I should have I should have already taken those out. <laughs> like yeah, like I, I move can, on, next tragedy. No, no, yeah, like I gotta find <laughs> something else. Or wait for it to happen again and find that sweet spot, right? So the, Yeah, it's the sweet spot, exactly. There's there's gonna be and I think it is. There's a catharsis. There's a healthiness of laughing in the face of death and tragedy. The I guess the I guess the really the really hard part in any of these is finding that buffer zone between something that is by for whatever reason 
has a funny ring to it, and not wanting to uh, s sort of be a attacking the people who are victims of the crime, or not trying to actually be hurtful towards them right. at the same time. Exactly, exactly. So there's definitely going to be there's definitely going to be a tenor of exactly how you are referring yeah. to the tragedy in your in your joke. Um, and then other funny stuff. Um, there's a really interesting study looking at how men know how to make other men angry in games in in, in games of competition. Oh. There's strategy involved. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so there's an effect that's called the um, the Matarazzi effect after Marco Matarazzi, who got um, Zinedine Zidane really angry during the World Cup finals in 2006 and got him ejected from the game. Um, and so it's that was strategically beneficial to Matarazzi absolutely. to get Zidane so mad that he reacted in that way. Um, so these uh, researchers publishing in PNAS, they had a they had a a couple of games. The first one was a game of strength, and the second one was like a duel where pe the players had to start twenty steps apart and turn to each other and then choose whether or not to shoot or to take a step forward. Um, and the first one relating to strength, they had these strength grips, and they basically had to squeeze the the strength grips to see who was the stronger and the one who won became a decision maker and could assign a task a totally menial boring awful office task to the loser to do for a set amount of time and so he could you could say they could decide whether or not to make them do it at all or for how and for how long up to about 20 minutes and then they then they went back to the the squeezy hand grips to see how strong they were and players it turns out the players who had been given the whole 20 minute assignment got better they got stronger mm. in the second round my question here is whether or not a menial office task really is enough to get a guy angry but I guess it is Justin can you so yeah this is uh, this and, is <laughs> Part of the the, the 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 verbal combat skills that you need to be successful in a lot of sales jobs, <laughs> where you're working with other salespeople and it's a competitive environment. Um, the psychological warfare is sometimes ninety percent of your day, and and, um. it, and it's. And it depends on the, you know what the office space is, what the workplace is, what what all that it, you know what the environment is, right? Um, but we there's the the phrasing for it. Uh, can can you say and bleep me if this is something I can't say? Don't say, say a bad say, word. Well, no, I don't know if it's a bad word. It's not a. It's <laughs> undefined. It's on the border. Can you say? Uh, should I spell it just in case there's children listening? There, there's a science class modify watching. It? It's in the Q and A. You can't say bad things. Can but you it's modify a, it? It's a C word, but it's not the C word. It's a it's C R. A -C it's a C R, and then it's later on in the word it ends in A P. <laughs> can I use? Is that a word I can use? I don't even know if I can use no, that word on the radio. No, for the radio, no. So but. anyway, it's that C R <laughs> ends in A P word out. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to C-R-A-P them out. Right? <laughs> and the way you do that can be sometimes extremely subtle. And, and it can be something like, like I know that, I know that, uh, that, that Blair has, has four, four units of accomplish uh, four, four sales, four sales this, this month so far. Which is Only pretty four? Good. No, no, it's pretty four. good, actually. You're pretty proud of the four. It's been a tough month, and then I start bragging on her behalf. It's like, yeah, but I mean, wow, nobody's doing as good as Blair. Blair's rocking this month. Blair's got seven out. Blair's got seven out this month so far, and then Blair has to go. Oh, actually, I only I only have four. So it takes what was an accomplishment of having four, and then having to say, well, no, it's not nearly that good. It's only four. Little, I mean, it's like daily, daily, psych daily psychological tricks. Psychological stuff. 
and it and it does work. People get frustrated and irritated or disinterested and less impassioned about what they're doing if they don't okay. feel good about what they're doing. That's okay. I I am glad to hear. I'm glad and, to get this, this viewpoint from you. This takes place in sports too. It makes more too. sense. Yeah. Uh, that one of my favorites was um, Warren Sapp of the uh, of the um, uh, Tampa Bay Bucks. He used to say all kinds of crazy stuff to people and when he was a defensive guy on a football team, for those who don't know. And he used to say, tell people, like, just F your life. F your life. And, you know, just, like, psych him out and be a raving lunatic and saying horrible things to people. And he says, like, you know, after well, after he'd retired, one guy he'd been playing against came up to him and was like, did you really mean that? Because what did you mean by that? Like, why did you say that to me? Like, he was really affected years and years later. It, like, years never left later. him. It never left wow. him. Like, why did you say that to me? I was just, like, you were, I was, you were one of my favorite players. He's like, oh, it's just, you know, psyching just you out in one game. In one game, yeah. Wow. What, right. what people, though, can find, where, that, where, where people find that looking really ugly, though, if you're in the game, if you're on the sales floor, if you're in the competition, if you're on the sporting team, you expect that sort of uh, trash talking to take place. Where it, where it looks ugly is when it takes place after the competition has ended. Right. That's when you that's look a, like a real a That's real when you, you start looking like a not nice person. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so we had this strength test, right? And the players could come back in the second round, and those who had the full assignment had been given this long, menial task. They were really, they got stronger. Rawr, they competed better. In the duel, however, those players who had gotten the full 20, set, 20 minutes of work were more likely to shoot first, in 70% of the trials and so the the way that the duel worked is that if you took a step forward your odds of hitting your opponent opponent increased so it would be better more strategic of you to turn and take a step as opposed to shooting first but the uh, players who had become angered were more likely to shoot first as opposed to taking a step and that reduced their ability to actually accurately hit their opponents yeah, so the take-home message of this is that in the competitive mind of the male, because this was all, all, all in men, that it is better to use anger strat ang strategy to anger your opponent if you're dealing with feats of strength or some kind of sporting thing, um, as opposed to a more strategic, um, I guess, emotion or control based yeah. emotional control based task and that's an important caveat I don't think getting into a war of words with women is ever beneficial for a man it always yeah. ends badly it'll never they, they, they've got <laughs> verbal combat skills like you wouldn't believe they can destroy you with very few words just avoid it if you can gentlemen yeah so the um, in the end um, in the end the this this is something that the decision makers actually uh, were able to kind of anticipate and the majority of decision makers did not give their opponents the full 20 minutes when doing the feats of strength and they were more likely to do the full 20 minutes before the, uh, the second round of the duel. So the so this is something that guys are using strategically, competitively. I don't know if guys do use it when working with women, though, because I don't believe that women work in this way. So I don't know that it would be beneficial hmm. for men to employ these strategies in the same way, seeing as women don't have, like, the same testosterone aggression kind of thing going on. Well, and they don't have as much direct intraspecific competition biologically. Yes. So in, if you're looking at kind of the biological ancestry of males doing antagonistic behavior and escalating behaviors to size each other up and discourage each other from competing for resources or females or whatever, that doesn't really happen with females Oh, sure it does. That uh, much. I mean, no, it doesn't sure it happen does. nearly as much. There's not a lot of... It happens, but not as much. Yes, no, not there's not nearly women. as many documented mm -hmm. cases of seeing that in other species as there are with males. 
Yeah. <laughs> Kevin Unique in the chat room says, sorry, Kiki, it works. <laughs> So I'm guessing that Kevin Unique is using these tactics on women he knows. Well, you know, a woman with lower self-esteem is less likely to make you compete for her. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. So we will end the discussion of this story and... Before I say something... <laughs> and move, move along to our quick science news summary so that we can finish this show because we're running a bit long. Blair, did you have any headlines? Yes. Um, squirrels scare birds away from bird feeders. They, I just have to mention how they did the story because it's really funny how they did the study. They had a bird feeder with seeds in it. They had a bird feeder with a, with a piece of cardboard blocking the door so the birds could still get in, but there was a visual barrier. And then they had a bird feeder with a stuffed squirrel on it. And <laughs> squirrels reduced birds feeding at bird feeders by 97 to 98 percent. So another reason to not like squirrels, they're distracting birds or they're scaring away birds and that's a big problem in the UK because gray squirrels are introduced. But so that was one of them. Be... You could use them like a scarecrow. Yeah, or, or it could mean that birds are just afraid of plushies. I don't know if it would work on crows, Kiki. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, and then my other one is Frog fathers prefer to put their tadpoles in cannibal-infested pools. Oh my That's gosh. right. They prefer to put their, their babies in the pool where there are larger tadpoles that might eat their babies. And that's because they'd rather risk that than risk putting them in a pool that didn't have cannibals in it because that, mean the pool, that means the pool might dry out or not have proper nutrients or oxygen. For some so, reason, it wasn't selected. By the right, so there's a, it's an empty You have been pool. selected. <laughs> so it's empty, that means it's probably a bad choice. They'd mm. rather risk the cannibals. Wow. All right. Yikes. Mm. Sounds like Not my school. tadpoles. <laughs> None of yours. They've been coddled. Justin, do you have any headline stories you want to blurb? I think I think I got to, down to the... Oh, um, wait, there, oh wait, there was one. There was one. Uh, Alpha Centauri B uh, may possibly, this is a, a search for extraterrestrial life far beyond Earth's solar system, looking for planets or moons outside our uh, outside the stellar ha habitable zone. This is, they may have discovered a super habitable world. They're not, wow. this is what they're looking for. Planets that are even more in favor of supporting life than planet Earth. So these super habitable worlds would have unique characteristics that make them ideal, more ideal, even than planet Earth, for having life other than the fact that we are already here. And one of the ones that made the list is Alpha Centauri B, which I think if we go through um, science fiction history... Mm -hmm. and the amount of silly-looking aliens that were from Alpha Centauri B. Yeah. We can find, actually, they were aliens from Alpha Centauri B that were trying to get acting gigs. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Yeah. Ah, oh, dear. Um, and finally, if anyone wants to get out their binoculars or telescopes, you will be able to see, or you pretty much can see, a supernova. There's been a, an explosion in the sky 12 million years ago or so. Um, it was observed by astronomers working with the ARC 3.5 meter telescope at the Apache Point Observatory uh, at 847 UTC on January 22nd. And uh, it is seen in the M82 Cigar gal Galaxy, if that means anything to you. The Cigar so, Galaxy? The Cigar Galaxy. Yes. It has been classified as a type 1A supernova. Researchers are working to try and determine if that is indeed what it is, but it is in the M82 cigar galaxy. Sometimes a cigar galaxy is just a cigar galaxy. Hmm? Uh, I'm having a quick moment. Look for supernova. Where I look for... 
Okay, Universe Today has got news on where to find it. Uh, Bright Galaxy and Ursa Major. So that's the uh, big, the Big Dipper, right? The Big Bear. So there you go. It's in Ursa Major. So you should. It's just a little bit brighter than it was before. So you'll be able. You need a four-inch telescope to be able to see it. Is what they're saying. But there we go. I found it. Ursa Major. Check it out. One of the stars, it's brighter there. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that's about it. Shout outs this week. Um, I want to send a big old shout out to everyone out there in the chat room who is chatting away and everyone who has been uh, who has been supporting us on Patreon. This has been we're getting up there, everybody. We still need your support. On next week's show, once again, we'll be broadcasting live on, online, 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live. You can watch and join our chat room, but don't worry if you can't make it. You can find our past episodes at youtube.com slash thisweekinscience or just at twist.org. And don't forget to tell a friend about Twist and to check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, or if you have a mobile device, you can look for the Twist 4 Droid app in the Android Marketplace or Twist in the Apple Marketplace. Mm -hmm. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website, www.twist.org. That's T-W-I-S dot O-R-G where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. Or you can contact us uh, directly by email. It's uh, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line so your email isn't spam filtered into oblivion. You can also ping us on the Twitter... Uh, we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that came to you in the night, please let us know. And we'll be back here next week. We hope you'll join us again for some more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science is the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop. Got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in. I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just better understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma, got the eye Cause it's this week in science This week in science 
because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought. And I'll try to answer any question you've got. But how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, 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 this week in 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 science. I really would like to stop this now. <laughs> stop! It just totally unnamed something. How did that happen? Beep, 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 beep. Beep, beep. <laughs> beep, beep. I now have a no not named song. That is not great. That's not great. I don't know what just happened. It's not great. I don't know what happened. I hit a button that I normally hit, and then it was like... <laughs> How did it happen? How did I delete the name of the song in iTunes? And now it won't let me do it. It really wanted to get rid of it. That's our theme song. Oops. Preferably no, you would not be getting rid of that. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> you haven't done that. You have no need for this song anymore. But I do. You know, Apple, it's like, oh, we don't need to ask you if you actually wanted to do that. What'd I miss? Oh, uh, nothing. I just deleted our theme song. Oh no! Uh, uh -uh. Really? Not really? Well, I have it. On. I can. I can. I can put it. I can fix it. I did not. I unnamed it. Where's Blair going? Is this so? Is this my internet or everybody? Is is Blair's in internet? Well, let's do a let's do a countdown, shall we? Yeah, did I have a did I have count? I say one, two, you say three. I say three, four, you say I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you're good, Kiki. You and I are in sync. Blair seems Has to have left the building. No, she's not frozen. I went to another oh, world. Geez. I'm back now. I'm back now. You were just looking to the side and thinking. I went on a brief vacation from this realm. I, I, I left our realm, but I'm back now. Hey, you guys, um, I didn't want to do it during the show, but if anyone wants tweets yelled at them, <laughs> <laughs> go to at Shouty Blair. I've been That's surprised right. how many famous people and celebrities have responded to my shouts. Really? 
<laughs> just shouting at people, and they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Shouty Blair is doing well Shouty in the tweet Blair. World. I only have 67 followers, though. At but Shouty they're Blair. All, they're all good followers. You haven't. You have. You have been very selective in who yeah. people allowed to follow you. Yeah. I guess you can't. You don't get really allow people. And what I actually think is intriguing is the fact that Shouty Blair has bled into your Facebook. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> it's just turning into no, Shouty Blair just, all the time. The, the, I just the, yell. You know the, me. I'm loud. The cap lock is just engaged 24/7 now. That's with true. Blair. No going back. Oh, my goodness. Get info. Info. Name. There we go. Twist. It, what was it called? Huh? The internet doesn't like me. <laughs> they were like, they were going to get her for yelling at us last week. No. Interesting. Silly Intermanets. Intermanets? Intermanets. I was going to oh, say, I was going to say, uh, it's time to do our shout outs. Oh, nice. But I didn't. Our <laughs> so I don't shout out. Microphone. No. Shout it! Yay, okay, it's the... It, I, I put a name back on it again. It is no longer... Quote marks. <laughs> yes, now it has a name again. There we go. Yay! I can fix things. I is okay. I is... I is... I is talented at things sometimes. Interesting. So there was a study I was trying to read through earlier, and it didn't really get to. Mm -hmm. uh, prediction that the El Nino effect is going to double. Instead of being oh, once yeah. every 20 years, it's going to happen once every 10 years. Or yeah, that's not doubling. great. No, it's, it's, it's an interesting one, though, um, because it's a great example of climate change versus just talking about warming. Um, yep, yep. It is a warming trend. It's a South Pacific warming trend that takes place. Um, the Navy does for, has been for years monitoring Southern Pacific Ocean temperatures. And they can predict El Nino's pretty well. If there's an unseasonably warm ocean surface temperature in the South Pacific, we, we're likely heading for an El Nino event. What an El Nino event means... No rain. Is, well, no, it, it's different depending on where on the planet mm -hmm. you are. Yeah. So El Nino in Southern California means we're going to have fierce winds and a lot of rain. It's going to be like flood-like rains. Really? Is it is it rain yeah. here? I thought El Nino... El Nino means catastrophic drought in Australia. Mm -hmm. It El was Nino super rainy means... during El Nino here. Yeah, yeah I remember that. El Nino means uh, Pacific Northwest or Central, like Ohio areas, are going to have unseasonal amounts of snowfall. They're going to have a fierce. So it's 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 a it's a good example of you're going to get weather extremes that you don't otherwise normally get, but can, they could be completely diametrically opposed depending on where you live. So it's it's. El Nino is a great example of a weather pattern that takes off because of temperature and pressures and blah, 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 but won't mean the same thing to everybody who's experiencing it. I'm just looking, because I've always, I, I thought that it led to the El Nino. Is it, the, is it drought follows the El Nino in California? It, it may actually, and I, I don't know this, but it may, it may cause... Drought conditions further north, uh, like where we are, ish maybe. I don't really know. I know in LA it me meant that you're in for a severe winter, a lot of rain, flood-like conditions. Mm 
Strong winds. Crazy winds. Dry winds, though. When the winds come through, they're coming through dry. And there's a heat with it, too. There is a heat with the El yeah, Nino which winds. Is, yeah. It's a dry, but, but it's usually then, uh, at least my experience is the El Nino is also meant really, really crazy, wet, rainy Southern California times. Hmm. It, and it causes strange behaviors in people, too. It it makes your spouse who's in the kitchen and <laughs> kind of study the edge of the knife a little closer, sort of study your neck a little too much. I mean, it it's, has effects beyond the weather as well. Sure. Yeah, no, so Wikipedia says... Um, Let's see. Uh, first signs of an El Nino are rise in surface pressure over the Indian Ocean, Indonesia, and Australia, fall in air pressure over Tahiti and the rest of the Central and Eastern Pacific Ocean, trade winds in the South Pacific weaken or head east, warm air rises near Peru, causing rain in the northern Peruvian deserts, warm water spreads from the West Pacific, which would be where we are, right? Yeah. Or... Are we considered no, the East Pacific? We are the East. We are the East Pacific because we're the West Coast. That's why I'm getting confused. But the water transfers from the Western. Coast. Okay, warm water spreads from the West Pacific and the Indian Ocean to the East Pacific. It takes the yeah. rain with it, causing yeah. extensive drought in the Western Pacific and rainfall in the normally dry Eastern Pacific. That's where I was getting confused. Yeah. So, so drought in Australia and rain here. And not just okay. rain, but the torrential downpour. Torrential. That is largely focused in Southern California, which is where the water from reservoirs is headed and isn't really got that much reservoiriness about itself. And <laughs> like they don't have anywhere to put all, all that, that rain water. But yeah. the ocean. Lots of flooding. Yeah. Yeah, there's a. I, I, I know last week there was a, uh, a story suggesting that there was. Uh, so we're in a mega drought right now. Everything's going very poorly can, uh, as far as rainfall is concerned. No great outlook through most of the, the rest of this year as far as a lot of experts are concerned. But then today I read something that suggested that there might be signs of an El Nino stirring, which would be interesting. Right. There will be right. lots so, and lots. So you, you, knowing almost that we have, the, you almost said the word. You almost said the word. You said interesting. It, it actually might be good. good news for California. Woo! <laughs> no, this it is could be great news for California. Other, I mean, it will it will cause a bunch of damage though if an El Nino mm -hmm. does come through yeah. next year, uh, because if we have a drought all year long, the ground is going to be really hard. There's not going to mm -hmm. be a lot of place for the water to go. And Houses so will be gonna, destroyed. Yeah. yeah. There's going to be flooding, flooding. If that if it happens, there'll be flooding, 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 flooding. So we'll see so what happens. This, wait, so is this this isn't too soon to make the jokes though? We can make we can make we can make jokes, jokes now, now because it's make not even happening. <laughs> then it'll happen and we'll be like, okay, shh, wait, wait for it. Thirty six, thirty eight days later. Thirty six days. We'll be able to spring <laughs> the flood jokes back out again. But only for that hilarious. one day. Yeah. <laughs> only that one day, and then yeah. we have to stop again. Then we stop because nobody cares anymore. Well, and you know, and and this was this was the this is the I think part of the prediction, the modeling that kept kept uh, sticking in my head about global warming that California was to see more rain. No, it's not really that we're going to get more rain. We're going to get more severe rain weather, which is the El Nino increasing. Yeah, so hopefully, which, which, if we can get really good at capture. Like, uh, yeah, at water capture. Yeah, we can get really good at water capture. Create... And hopefully, the, and the problem is it's probably going to be really warm, though. What we want is snow. Right, because so that, we can that's get a snow sustainable. Yeah. yeah. Although, although I wouldn't be surprised if, if in El Nino, if we've got moisture, once it hits the Sierras, it's going gonna, it's gonna to freeze out. It's going to freeze out and drop yeah. the snow. And it, we'll, we'll probably get a nice ice pack there, too. Fingers crossed for El Nino for California. Not so much for Australia. Sorry, Australia. We do no, love but you, they're really. Not, they're not really. Can we just get back to normal? No. Yeah. What no, is normal? It's never normal. been. Nothing's ever been normal. There is no normal. Yeah. Just not bad. 
Now, and here's here's a big part of the normal, and we could get a lot closer, I think, to 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 the normal, which is the good old days that never existed. I too have nostalgia for the good old days that never existed, when there wasn't as much traffic, when there wasn't as many people on the roads in California. So a big part of um, what we can't get back to is, you know, reasonably, sanely, is zero or negative population growth. So part of the pressure on our water system is the fact that we've got more people using it and we're creating more food with it. We're, we're exporting too, by the way. California exports so much food, not just to the rest of the nation, but to the world. Uh, we, we are, I think, 80% of produce in the United States. I mean, we're a ridiculously high number of... That's of, not good. No, we're, we're a, a, a very high number of the produce made we're like the top almond garlic and and whatever like kiwi producer but we're also just your regular bread basket vegetables we're like a top producer um, and we export it and we exporting then essentially fresh water to to much of the country much of the world what what we the areas we need to focus on and and the usage of water in the state is almost almost entirely agriculture. You know, yeah. the municipal usage is somewhere between 10 to 20, we'll call it 15%, just to find a happy medium number of the actual water being used. We've actually been decreasing. We've been dropping by a few percentages of municipal water use because of all the, you know, the lower flow toilets, a little bit more awareness, a little less lawn watering, that sort of thing. Yeah, I just want to. The big difference maker would be in. Uh, sorry, the big difference maker would be in more uh, uh, agriculturally conservative methods of watering crops. Yes. Something along that yes. line. Yes. Yeah. Going to have the biggest impact on this. Absolutely crop. agree with that. Um, I just want to share this picture from um, from a website of a dust cloud descending on Melbourne, Melbourne. Australia in 1983, a super El Nino year. Yeah. So super El Nino is what they're talking about, that these likelihoods of El Ninos are going to go up and that they will become more often super El Ninos. Uh, super El Ninos have extreme results and it's just... Wait, I can't imagine that? That? conditions so dry that you end up with these this kind of a giant dust cloud effect. I mean, this is... Intense to me. What what year was that? Eighty three. Okay. That was I think, I think eighty three was one of the last um, big 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 storm years. I think that it, it was one of the last big rain years that California so, really had. Right. So listen to this. Yeah, it's, uh, Sacramento, which is one of the places where they track, they had ten inches of rain fell in an eleven day period in nineteen eighty three. Yeah. Right. I mean that's a big rainy year. Yeah, that was a a massive rainy year actually across the United States. I'm looking at Mississippi floods, all kinds of crazy stuff going. Yeah, Lower Mississippi flooded, '83. Utah had floods in '83. So you know it's uh, it's going to be good for Cal uh, for the United States water supply. <laughs> well, no, it is. <sighs> it just moves. It's it's transporting water to different places in the world. It's moving it from one place to another. It has, and not in a have, gradual way. <laughs> not in a like, gradual way. Bam! Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, a question from the Q and A. I think uh, there was uh, someone in Santa Rosa. Andreas wants to know how old I am. Um, old enough to know better than to answer this question. <laughs> the proper question would be. <laughs> Have you looked goodness. at Wikipedia yet? I think oh, it's yeah, actually. That's what I, was I think, say, I think go my birthday is actually on the Wikipedia entry for it me. It is. So as opposed to my actually saying how old I am. Just go to Wikipedia. It's just being sad. <laughs> I'm going to send you to Wikipedia. And I don't know how Wikipedia got that real answer. Some. Somewhere. Eh. Somebody learned Probably about Probably someone's me. your friend on Facebook or something. I know. I know. They learn these things. And um, who is my favorite researcher in the science world? <laughs> That's hard to say. Um, 
let me let me think about that. I'll think about that and get back to you. Yeah. Why is my child still crying? I can hear my child crying. This is not good. I have a feeling my husband will come down here and say, Kiki, I need you sometime soon. This usually happens when the crying happens very late. Mm. It hasn't been for a long time. Just, I wonder just, what happened. just count yourself lucky that there are no shopping carts around. <laughs> um... I want Cal Academy Lectures. There is, let's see, who is the name of this person? I'm going to find it eventually. Do, 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 do. Mm. I have so many favorite researchers in the science world. I really like people who are curious and who think deeply about things. I think every time I interview a new sci a scientist I haven't interviewed before, I'm like, oh my god, you're my new favorite scientist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're doing such amazing, amazing work. Oh my goodness. I really like Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins, I meh. I like him, but I don't. Okay. Tell what, me why you like him. What don't you like about him? Yeah. I, oh, I don't like that he is so um, hard and firm about um, about religion about mm. science and atheism and that, uh, I mean, he really is not nice about it. And he's, well, he basically tells people that they're stupid if they believe in anything. And I guess, I guess, yeah, I guess I agree with him. And I don't appreciate that. I guess I agree with him and that's why. I, I don't know, I don't know that I... <sighs> I, I don't agree with his way of engaging with the public yeah. on that issue. As a scientist, he is a, he is a brilliant man, and he has done a lot of amazing work. Uh, Dawkins was selfish gene. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Selfish gene. So, uh, Which we talked yeah. about tonight. I mean, we talked about yeah. it in a number of stories tonight. Yeah. Uh, that, Majorly that, influential work. Yeah, the genes actually influence the mating behavior of the flies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, it's it's pervasive, his, his view. It's... It's everywhere. It keeps it keeps popping up. It keeps revealing itself, in in more and more examples. And I disagree. I don't think he, because he's such an articulate guy, he doesn't come out and tell people that they're stupid. But he does. He does illustrate uh, for them some of the things that they should be questioning about a belief system that has people flying on horses to the moon, or other such nonsense. I mean, and I appreciate it because I think uh, more so than anybody else, maybe except with the perhaps um, a few other, uh, you know, examples out there. When he talks, I don't really feel like I've learned anything, but I feel like I'm agreeing with everything that he says. But he says it in a way that makes you feel like it's obvious, but you actually did learn a lot. That's what he's doing. He's saying things in a way that he's he's solidifying the causal chain so perfectly yeah. that you listen to what he says and you're like, well, obviously that's how it works. Obviously. But he's actually introducing a new idea. Right. That's what's so great about him, in my opinion. And I feel like he's less he's less saying people with re like that are religious are stupid, and he's more compartmentalizing it is the way I see it. 
Science yeah. is science. Religion yeah. is religion. Let's not muddy the waters of science with religion. Let's focus on science. <laughs> yeah, my, my which favorite... I really appreciate. I feel like I th I feel like it really should be compartmentalized. We were just talking about this earlier that they're trying to put creationism in a science class. It's not science. Compartmentalize it. Your religious stuff is over here. Your scientific stuff is over here. Let's just not have them be in the same place. Yeah. Not in the same bucket. Mm -mm. Not in the same bucket, people. Mm -mm. That's why I like him. He's just, he's, he's not afraid of his, uh, I guess, PR personality. And he just and, says. Yeah. And he says things, yes. And I think you're soft Which pedaling an it, Blair. Elderly's... I think you're, I think you're soft pedaling it. No, that's not, that's not quite right. Truth of the matter is, he is an anti-theist, and he does believe that these ideas are harmful to the species overall, and that science has a superior perspective. He does believe he that. He believes that, mm -hmm. and when he speaks that, that to that, I totally agree with him. And I wouldn't take that away from him at all in any way, shape, or form, because I think he's correct. And he doesn't do it. And he does it, like you say, in a very causal way, and he walks through the steps, and he explains why he's come to this conclusion. One of my favorite examples uh, that he does is the appearance of specialness and appearance of having will of the universe, where he does a coin-flipping test with a, with a room full of people. This side of the room, I want you to will it to be heads. This side of the room will will it to be tails, and he flips the coin. Right? One side's now you can sit down or whatever. Now those who are still remaining, this these rows are gonna pick are, are gonna will this to be a heads. This from this row down, will it to be tails. And he does this until he's delivered it down to one person. And this one person, because of the experiment, the way he set it up, this one person may have chosen heads or tails correctly seven times in a row. The probability of being able to do that is being 250 bazillion to the half of the to the one, right? But there's one person who, at the end of just forcing it to be this is that or that's this all the way down, he'll find one person in that audience who has willed the coin to be heads or tails every time and been completely correct. And there is absolutely nothing special about them. <laughs> there's right. nothing psychic about them. There's nothing that they've actually done to influence the flip of the coin, even though they've been right Seven times because it's completely artificial. It's the luck of the draw out of that so many people in a room. So he goes out to psychics, yeah. mystics, any every religion. He's not against one particular viewpoint. He's an anti-theist. He doesn't believe that theistic ideology is healthy for planet Earth. And I, I totally agree with him. So I find no fault in him. Yeah, well, I it's really like him. So what does that tell you? You like him. You like him as a scientist, as a scientist. Which so, you don't get, so you don't have to say fabulous. anything, Blair. I'll continue. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm trying to think of other scientists that I think are really awesome. Um, Miguel Nicolelis is amazing. He's doing some just cutting-edge work in brain-computer interfaces. He's doing. He's involved in the, the monkey robot stuff. He's a really bright guy. Um... I also really like, uh, who was the guy that we talked about last week with the, uh, the crazy physics guy from, M from MIT? Um, see, my problem is name recall. This is the mm -hmm. <laughs> MIT physics. Uh, does anyone in the chat room remember what his name was? He's written a book just come out recently. Nobody in the chat room can help me on this one. No. I'm looking in the know. chat room and I found for for that and I found <laughs> Ed. I don't know if it was a if it was a mistype. It's supposed to be no one on the planet, but it says no one on plant. Has more curiosity about science than Justin. Because <laughs> that could mean it's something good. completely different than being... Yeah, it could when you're on some plants. <laughs> no one on plants! Man, Not on plants! Man, when you're on some plants! Way, like, 
stuff was happening and like, that plant. Like how does how come gravity it really makes you wonder? How I think gravity increases uh, depending on the mass of plant that you're on. Let's see, it could really. Ah, the wonderful mind guy. Yeah, whoever that guy is, the the creator of game theory. Mm. I love. I I do really love game theory because it simplified all humanity into into being selfish. Let's look at our notes from and, last week. And the fact that it works and it's yeah. kept us out of the cold wars that could have been if we didn't understand that. Which goes into a whole rant about why we need the NSA looking into everybody's emails, but whatever. I love it. NSA needs to. They need to. Oh, what was the guy's name? Wasn't it last week? You're getting which, tired? Which what? story? Yeah, I'm getting tired. Why tell us? That's... Um, maybe it was two weeks ago. I thought it was last week. Because I'm indicating subtly that we should go. That wasn't see. subtle. That was anything but subtle. <laughs> that was not oh, subtle. Oh, I want to go. I'm going to leave. Because I don't want to be here anymore. I go. My favorite researcher... I know. I just I I appreciate so Max Tegmark. I think he's interesting. Are we talking working today or of all time? That's a good question. Because Buffon, I did a story on Buffon. He or I did a report in all in French on this guy named Buffon, who was the first. I think he was the first guy to go to uh, faraway lands, do mm. sketches and studies on wild animals, and bring his book back to Europe, which was France, right? He brought it back to France. This so was like the first time a raccoon was, was talked about. It's the wow. first time there's a picture of a lion in Europe. Like mm. it, was, uh, it was pretty enormous in the animal science world. Pretty cool. I would go Einstein if I'm going like all time in everything. And 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 it's like 80 70% because of the science and 20 30% because of his outspoken pacifism. I like I like I like Einstein on on all of his levels. He's like my favorite guy. If I'm going throughout history but and it's, it's a date. And I, it's a little trickier. Yeah, and I think I, you know, I'd also. I have to, I have to give big props to the, uh, the women scientists, the female scientists who, uh, were my mentors, mm -hmm. as I was going through grad school. Coming up, there were some pretty amazing women: Nikki Clayton, Gabby Nevitt, Dorothy. Oh, I'm blanking on her last name. There it goes. Out of the brain. See? Name recall. No good. No good at all. Uh, uh, guy who's uh, no longer with Geitzen. us. Geitzen. Dorothy Geitzen. Geitzen. Guy's no, no longer with us, but was definitely an inspiration to me. Uh, Neil, Neil Sharkey, who was head of uh, UC Davis Orthopedics Department, did a high school, junior high school, high school internship. Hmm. little summer job gig there and got more inspired by the possibilities and potentialities of what science is and does than any teacher uh, it, it up till then had ever been able to instill. Neil yeah. Sharkey, he, so this is, this is Justin, high school <laughs> kid, summer job making, I think it was $4, 4 dollars four twenty five an hour was the minimum wage, working four hours in his lab. I think I was supposed to be there to like clean lab equipment or something. Put me in charge of a NASA experiment where I was working a diamond, diamond lathe, a diamond tooth lathe to saw monkey bone in different plastics. Then to then to go and do a, a, a what is the compression brake test to see at what pressure the things broke. Then then brought me in to to when he was using a, this new Chinese tiny needle where we cut the jugular of a, of a mouse and re-sutured it under massive uh, you know, 
uh, uh, microscope, micro surgery microscope, and using this the first time in the U.S. this tiny needle had been used. I mean, he threw down every boundary possible for me to be able to get excited and interested in science. It was totally awesome. That's cool. I think I think that's one of the for me. I love people who are big big thinkers, deep thinkers who really try and get into you know they're so into their research. They they think about it from so many different angles and don't get stuck just in their own little niche, I guess. Yeah. Um, and who don't get too much ego about what they do, so that they're willing yeah. or their their excitement overrides their ego so that they want to share what they're learning and they want to try and tell people about it and they're just like this is so cool you know so I'm, scientists who are excited about talking about what they're doing and try to explain it and don't just try to uh, you know don't just look down on people who aren't scientists or don't get it you know try and actually incorporate what they do into the real world that's those are the people that I really look up to Big egos, I don't have room for that. I don't. I don't have time for big egos. I don't mind a big ego. Uh, I could care less about it. I don't get. Ego. I don't. I don't think. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily a, a bad thing, but you know, yeah. I think we learned a lot from Freud, and Freud had a ginormous ego. What? What you talk? What you say? You get down on the couch. I tell you what you think. No. No. More like. I am a big man on cocaine, and you are a very small, frightened woman right now. That's right. Please don't argue with me. I have taken a lot of this. I have taken cocaine. You would like some? No, yeah, you will have dreams. You will like your dreams. You're, no, you will not sleep. No, no you don't. No, take cocaine. It's good. <laughs> Sigmund Freud, in a nutshell. <laughs> Uh, all Goodness. right, Sleepy Blair. I know. I'm As opposed tired. to Shouty Blair, we have Sleepy Blair, which is guys. I'm trying. Good. It's ten o'clock yeah. here. It's it's good. I work hard. You do work hard. I do I work. Registration for the Baymobile is open. Yay! So awesome. if you're a school teacher in the Bay Area. Go to the aquarium's website, register for a program. Aquarium Hooray. by the bay. Of the bay. Of the bay. Aquarium <laughs> of the bay. There we go. Aquarium yes. of the bay. Yes, yes, yes. And follow me on the Twitters, at Shouty Blair, at Blair's Menagerie. I'm trying to be a lot more active on Twitter. I'm, I'm up there. You're doing it. Doing it and doing it and doing it right. And I'm going to lots of Sketchfest stuff, SF Sketchfest. Very excited. Oh, cool. Good comedy. I'm going to like four or five things, yeah. Awesome. I hope Most you of have them... many smiles and belly Oh, aches. I will. I will. Aching Most of them cheeks are... and belly muscles. Yeah. They're mostly <laughs> podcast tapings, which is really cool. That's cool. My, po my comedy podcasts. Laughing is good. Mm -hmm. It's very good. All right. Bye, everybody. Mwah. Good night. Mwah. Thanks for everybody for watching. We will have more sciencey stuff to talk about next week. Oh yeah, and uh, updates and things for the post show. There, we always have more stuff to talk about week after week. So come back next week and get some more twists. You hear and tell your friends about it, and also Patreon. I think that's it. Stopping the broadcast right now. Hitting the button. Bye.